Good evening. If you would please stand with anticipation. Did you come with anticipation tonight? Expecting to hear from the Lord. I hope so. There's one. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank God. I hope you did. Because I'm looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to it all day. We praise God for the week we've had already. But it's only half over. And we're praying the Lord will do even greater things as the, as the week goes on. More souls will receive help. Souls will be encouraged. Because I know God is willing and able to do that. So if you would, grab your small book. We'll open up the service. Page 92 in your small book. Dwelling in Beulah. Yeah. 
Praise Amen. God. Praise God for that experience. Please remain standing. Well, you sound good tonight. Thank God. When I came in tonight, one of my good parishioners said to me, well, we see you bullied Sarah and Phil to stay another night. <laughs> Did I bully you? I told him, I, yeah, I bullied him good. But we're glad that Sarah and Phil are staying. Yeah. They wanted to hear Brother Sankey preach. And um, we just thank God for the wonderful messages that we've heard. Yeah. Sarah, God gave you unusual strength. As sick as you were, and I don't know how many times you almost left this world, but God has been faithful and gave her the strength. And I don't know when I heard her preach so good. So we've really been blessed. We thank God for your message and, and uh, your commitment to the Lord. And now Brother Sankey and his wife Melody are here. And some of you may remember when he preached last year in a camp meeting. So he's going to be speaking now all the way through the week, and then Sunday morning we'll end the service. He and his wife are going to sing uh, a, a song for us this evening, and we're so glad to have you, Brother Sankey, you and your wife. I know it's her first time, and so behave yourself, okay? <laughs> you look like a left kid. <laughs> all right. Uh, Friday night, uh, we're going to have a pizza party. The kids, the youth are going to. And so they've uh, in, extended it to all of us. So Friday night, we'll have a pizza party. And then Sunday, after the uh, morning message, we're going to have a meal in the dining hall. And we're looking forward to that. All right, good to see each and every one of you. I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. And I'm going to ask Brother Bob if he'll come and word the prayer. And you're in for a real treat tonight when Brother Sankey speaks. And he's got some books and tapes out there, and he'll, he'll explain all of that. All I can say is praise God. Thank the Lord for all of his goodness. I'm glad he told us in his word Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much more as we see the day approaching, you know. Thank God for his goodness. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the goodness and the kindness that you've shown toward us. We thank you, Father, for the great services we've been having. We thank you, God, for each and every saint of God. Every message we've heard, Lord, Father, it's encouraged our heart. Oh, God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We just appreciate so much the privilege, Lord, to be able to come into your house, God. Father, to bring our burdens and needs before you and to know, God, that you supply all those needs. Father, we ask you tonight, God, that you'll be with our brother Sankey. God bless him so, Lord, mighty way, Father. Use him in that special way, God. May your presence, Lord, so move upon him. Oh, God, we're so glad we don't have to be looking at a book to go by. But, oh, God, we're glad we can follow your spirit, Father. Oh, we thank you for your goodness because... The Spirit of God is alive in our hearts today. We thank you, God, from the deep of our soul. Father, we pray you'll bless the choir. Bless all the spatial singing, Lord. Everything that's said and done, Father. And deal with the hearts and the souls of those that may not know you, God, as a personal Savior. We ask you, God, that you'll invite them, Father. And, oh, God, that they can receive you, Lord, into their hearts, God. Father, that they might become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Father, we ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. And amen.
Amen. This song that Cody's about to sing says, A wonderful shepherd is leading me on. He left the 99 for me. Praise God. Not only did he find me, but he saved me. Not only did he save me, he's keeping me. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What a Savior we serve tonight. Listen as we sing this song. Praise the Lord. Amen. Grab your little book, if you would, please. 
We're going to sing another song. If we take the evening offering, Victory Through Grace, page 60. In your little book, page 60. Conquering now and still to conquer, right the king in his mind, leading the host of all the faithful into the midst of the fight. See them with courage advancing, clad in their brilliant array, shouting the name of their leader, hear them exalting. Strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race, yet to the true and the faithful, victory is promised through grace. Conquering now and still to conquer, who is this wonderful king? Whence are the armies which he leads? the armies thou leadest, faithful and true to the last, find in thy mansions eternal, rest when their warfare is past. Not to the strong is a battle, not to the swift is the race, yet to the true Sister Sarah and Brother Phil have a song for us tonight. Figure if they stayed another day, we might as well use them. <laughs> no, this was planned. They knew they were singing. <laughs> Thank God. really don't need my help, but I'm just going to put in the third part for him. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. 
storms of life, like my Lord, like my Lord, He'll give rest to the weary, give new life to the hopeless. There's no Thank the Lord. We have a mixed trio or a quartet, I believe, to come and sing for us tonight. Pray for them as they come. I'm sorry, Beth, but Phil is ringing in my ear tonight. <laughs> It's my desire to make heaven my home. Amen. And there's nothing to turn back to. And I, it's my desire to never fail the Lord again. Amen. But to walk with him every step of the way. This song says, I will never turn back. He's my light every hour of the day. I will never turn back, for my Savior is leading the way. Listen as we sing this. Once I wandered in darkness unsaved Till the Savior came knocking at my heart And I Blessings to me he imparts. I will never, never turn back. Turn back. Turn back. He's, my He's my life every day. I will never, never turn back. Never turn back. Never turn back. For my sake. service each day may I be leading sinners to Jesus to be free for the blood flowing from Calvary is a cleansing for sinners unclean I will never Turn back, Never turn back. He's my life, He's my life. Every hour of the day, I will never turn back. Never turn back. turn back. For my Savior is leading the way. I've a hope of a home beyond the sky. By faith I shall see it by and by. Till that day I will rest on his word. And I'll never go back on my Lord. Sing it with us. And I will never turn back. Never turn back. Never turn back. He's my Lord. Turn back, never turn back, for my Savior is leading the way, for my Savior. 
is leading the way. Good to have brother and sister Sankey tonight. God bless you. Looking forward to hearing what you have for us tonight. Come on ahead. Well, we've enjoyed being here already tonight. Wow, what great music. I think I told you this the last time I was here. When I get to heaven, that's the style of music that will be playing in my, my corner. Uh, but thank you so much for ministering to our hearts with the wonderful music that, we have, uh, that we've heard tonight. Hopefully we can just add to what already has been a wonderful revival. Thank God for his help thus far. And we're trusting the Lord to help us in the remaining part of this service tonight and all the way through the week. So... Thank God. We have so much for which to be grateful, don't we? He's done so much, given us so many blessings. Listen as we sing. As the world looks upon me As I struggle along They say I have nothing But they are so wrong in my heart I'm rejoicing how I wish they could see thank you Lord for your blessings on me for there's a roof up above me I've got a good place to sleep there's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Now I know I'm not wealthy, and these clothes, they aren't new. Listen, I don't have much money, oh, but Lord, I have you. And to me, that's all that matters, though the world may not see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me. I've got a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. So thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank just want to thank you, oh Jesus, 
We just want to thank you, Jesus. We just want to thank you. Oh, we thank you for being so good. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Sankey, the real estate's cheap around here. <laughs> what beautiful singing tonight, huh? The Bible said the singers will be there. Where? In Zion. What a blessing it is to listen to spiritual singing. It really warms the heart and prepares us for the word of God. So glad to uh, have Mark and his wife with us. He hails out of Cincinnati, is that right, Mark? Yes. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about him, but uh, I'll see if I can bully, bully him a little bit and get some more out of him. But he preached a beautiful message during the camp meeting, and I think we're in for a real treat. He's truly a man of God. Um, couldn't get him here for almost a whole year. He's quite busy with mission work and also evangelizing, and he does a whole lot of things in between for God. So we're privileged to have Brother Mark Sankey, so let's receive him with a good amen. amen. And Melody, your piano playing is just like our gal. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Brother Tony. What a privilege to be here tonight. Thank God for his presence. The songwriter said, all is vain unless the presence, the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad to be here, but our presence really means nothing unless God shows up. And He's here tonight, and I thank God for it. Uh, let me just mention to you briefly what's on the table in the back. Uh, I have written a couple of books. Uh, one is entitled, In Angel's Charge, and this book tells the story of the attack on my life while we were missionaries in Mexico. And so this is a missionary storybook. A lot of stories from our time in Mexico are in this book, but primarily the story that took place in October of 2009. Lord willing, on Saturday night, I'll be telling that story. Uh, but that book is back there if you're interested uh, in that. And then a, a, a book that's just been out a year is entitled My Dad the Missionary, and it is a, a missionary biography of my dad and mom, uh, who were missionaries in Central America for a number of years. I was born in Honduras, and my two older sisters were born in Guatemala, where mom and dad uh, labored as missionaries for a number of years. And um, the stories that dad told when he came back from the mission field miraculous, incredible stories. Uh, we just were awestruck by uh, the things he would tell us about how God worked in those days. And we begged him for years, Dad, you need to write a book. That needs to be written down so other people can hear those amazing stories. And he resolutely refused to do so. And I think perhaps because he felt as though he might be promoting himself if he were to write a book like that. And so Melody and I took it upon ourselves as a labor of love to write this book about Dad. You don't know him, I don't think, but in our little subculture, he's a very well-known uh, leader, and many people know him as a leader, as a preacher, uh, involved in missions and so on, but very few people knew him as my dad, the missionary. And so if you're interested, that book is back there as well. We've been so heartened by the response we've received from it, people have come to us and them to say it's the best book they've ever read, the best missionary book they've ever read, and so we're honored and humbled that God would use it as he has. And then we do have uh, three music CDs. Uh, we do have, let's get this out of the way, we do have a Spanish CD. Anyone here speak Spanish? 
Anyone here know anyone or live by anyone or work with anyone who speaks Spanish? Maybe, yeah, a few more hands. This is back there, and if you're interested in that, uh, you can pick it up. It's a great evangelism tool. Give it to your neighbor or your coworker. There is some English on this Spanish CD. My dad and mom sing a song on this recording, and uh, they sung it and recorded it back in 1968. Uh, with just an accordion, and they sing a couple verses of their song in English. So you would be edified if you only speak English, uh, if you wanted to listen to that as well. Melody has a new piano CD out. She's been playing the piano since she was just a little girl. Uh, her dad and mom were pastors in Alabama, and she would walk over to the local funeral home, and as a little girl would play the organ or piano for funerals of people she didn't even know, but they needed help, and so... Uh, she's been playing for a long time, and I tell people everywhere I go that Melody will never impress you with sensational piano performance. Uh, she can do that. She has the talent to do that, but that's not what God has gifted her to do. But everywhere we go, God uses her to bring a sense of His presence as she plays. And I think I could promise you with certainty that if you listen to these songs, 15 songs, you all know them, they're familiar, you will be ushered into the presence of the Lord, and God's given Melody a special gift with her piano playing to do that, and so that's back there. And then a few years ago, I guess three years ago, we went to Roger Talley in Tennessee, and he produced and recorded this family CD, our three adult children, as well as our daughter-in-law sing with us on this CD, 11 songs, uh, the song we sang tonight is on there, and uh, we hired the very best bass singer we knew, or the, at least the best one we could afford, and uh, he came and sang a bass track on one of these songs, so there's even a quartet on here, trios and quartet and some duets, and that's all back there in the back as well, if you're interested, see us after the service. I usually forget to say this, but people ask, and so I'll mention it to you tonight, we do take cash and check and even credit cards, and she knows how to take your money with PayPal and I don't know what else. So when it comes to taking money, we, you know, we make sure we got plenty of ways to do that. But if you're interested, you can see us after the service about any of that, and we'll be happy to get those materials into your hand. Just by way of introduction, briefly, before I preach to you tonight, Brother Tony doesn't know a lot about me, and I don't know a lot about him or you, except that I sense a kindred, kindred spirit in the services that I've been in. Uh, let me just briefly share with you, I was born into a missionary home uh, in 1970 in the country of Honduras, and my dad and mom came back to the States when I was five, and dad pastored for 30 years, and then uh, Melody was born in Alabama to, to pastor parents, and we met at God's Bible School, and there we fell in love. We've been married for uh, 31 years. We have three children 27, 25, and 23, two of them are married, and the middle one looks like he's well on his way to, uh, to getting married, and so uh, we're grateful for how God has been with us and used our family through the years. We pastored right out of Bible college for 13 years, and then we went to Mexico for six and a half years, and since we've been back, uh, we've been involved in missions administration and evangelism, uh, traveling around the country in the work of the Lord. Uh, we have been on five different continents and 40 countries, and we're just humbled that God has seen fit to, to use us. You know, uh, it's not really anything that we do. God allows us to have a small part in His great work, and uh, we're thankful for that. So that's a little bit about who we are. We live in Cincinnati, have been there since 2015, so we're just right down the road from you all. And uh, so if you have questions, any more that you'd like to know, we'd be happy to let you know who we are. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Honored to be here tonight, and I trust that uh, the Lord will continue to meet with us. Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts chapter 2, and uh, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 2 and the very last part of that chapter in just a few moments. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, we'll begin reading, as I said, in a few moments, beginning in verse 41. It was just a few years ago that I found myself trekking through the Amazon jungle uh, in the country of Ecuador, having flown in on a jungle plane with a bush pilot onto a grass landing strip surrounded by tall trees, 
We landed and there was a welcoming party there to meet us and they led us back a rutted, muddy trail through the jungle uh, into a clearing where there were what appeared to be several Stone Age dwellings and one that looked kind of like a big teepee, no door, just some kind of cloth or skin across the opening. We were invited in. It was a dirt floor. The family lived in that one room. The kitchen was there. The, the bedroom was there. The living quarters, everything was right there, a dirt floor. Supper was crawling on the floor when we got there. Well, we came for a very special reason and for a very special man, and I had my back to the opening, and I felt someone tap me on the shoulder, and when I turned around, there he was, smiling broadly, and I looked at him, and I said, Mingaye, and pointed to him, and he nodded, and we embraced, and then we walked out into the warm sunlight, and he introduced me to Kimo, who was sitting on a log. Kimo and Minkaye were two of the members of the original spearing party in 1956 that martyred Jim Elliott and four of his missionary friends. We stood there with these men, now born-again believers, radically transformed by the grace of God in the Amazon jungle, listening to their stories and watching the Spirit of God flow through them. And we were just pinching ourselves to think God had given us this opportunity to meet uh, Minkaye and Kimo and be there. I saw Palm Beach. I saw where the missionaries were martyred those many years ago. And as we were getting ready to leave, to get back in that little plane to take off, I will tell you this, that the takeoff from that jungle airstrip was a lot more exhilarating than the landing. Because those tall trees at the end of the airstrip just getting, get, kept getting uh, taller and bigger, and it seems like we cleared, cleared the tops of those trees by just inches, but we made it. Before we got in the plane to go back to Shell, the same airport and the same runway that Nate Saint flew in and out of in those years leading up to his martyrdom, I asked a stupid question. I knew what the answer was. And before I could stop myself from asking, I heard myself saying, hey, by the way, where is your church? And the person who answered me said, oh, we don't, we don't have a church building. He said, the church meets over there. And he pointed to a little lean-to structure that was up against another building. He said, the church meets there. And I was reminded so powerfully in that Amazon jungle that afternoon that the church isn't a building. We're not inside the church. No, the church is inside this building. The church isn't a building. The church isn't a denomination. Although there are denominations that believe they are the church, not part of the church, the church. My dad was at a church conference of a certain denomination which will remain nameless, and he heard, 2,000 people there probably, he heard one of their preachers stand, and while he was preaching, say the most, almost blasphemous words that you could say, he held up their church manual, you know, their rule book, and he said, you don't need a Bible to get to heaven. You just need this book. Well, you know why he said that? Because he believed with all of his heart that his church, his denomination was the only way. And they still to this day believe if you don't belong to them, you're not getting in. But we know the church isn't a building. The church isn't a denomination. The church the is... Church the church isn't even really an organization. Now, the local expression of the church should be organized, of course, but the church isn't an organization. The church is a living, breathing, dynamic, growing organism. It is not bounded on any side by geogra geographical borders. It goes where the Spirit of God goes, and we are a part of that church. 
And Luke, in Acts chapter 2, gives to us a beautiful description of the perfect church. The church that God wanted us to be a part of. It was the ideal church. Now, I need to tell you that it didn't last very long. This ideal church. You know why? Because human beings make up the church. You don't have the perfect church and I don't have the perfect church. Why? Because we're part of it. But this was the perfect church. Because I believe that no movement is any truer to its purpose or more fervent about its vision than at its inception. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. We see the church being born. And Luke describes to us in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 in the following way, Then they that gladly received His word, speaking of Peter, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them, unto the church, about 3,000 souls. And they, the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, more, more than likely communion here, and in prayers. That was the liturgy of the early church. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And listen... Fear came upon every soul, verse 43, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together. Think about that. And had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. This was a willing, proactive gift of love. Verse 46, and they, the church continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat. No vegetarians in the early church. With gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, I don't know what happens in your spirit when you read those words, but there is something that resonates in my heart when I read Luke's description of the early church. Because there's something in me that stands up and says, Lord, I want to be a part of that church. Have you ever asked yourself, what made that early church so powerful? What made that early church so effective in fact, it was so powerful that when they would go to a new village, the people would say, oh no, here come the people who are turning the world upside down. How long has it been since our church could be accused of turning anything upside down? That early church had power. It was effective. What made it so? Well, Luke tells us. I think there are many things that made that early church powerful and effective, but Luke gives us the three main things, the three foundational things, and under each of those things, all the rest fall. Luke says this early church was powerful and effective, number one, because they persevered in right doctrine. Look at verse 42. They continued steadfastly. They persevered. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. Now, we don't talk about the apostles' doctrine. We don't use that terminology anymore. And someone might say, wait a minute, what, what's Luke talking about, the apostles' doctrine? Well, if you hold a Bible in your hands tonight or on your lap, or maybe it's on your phone, that is the apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostles' doctrine in the New Testament hadn't been written yet. It was all just orally being transmitted. They were preaching and they were teaching. But in the next few decades, 
what they were teaching on the day of Pentecost, what they were teaching in those first few years after the church was born would eventually be written down under the inspiration of this Holy Spirit and the New Testament that you hold in your hand is the Apostles' Doctrine. This early church centered their worship around the Word of God. And really, it was more than just the written word. And thank God we have the written word. But it was more than that. In fact, the disciples, the apostles, the early church weren't simply enamored with words on manuscript, but they were enamored and they were in love with a person. And all through the New Testament, you see who that person is over and over and over again on every page, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is being proclaimed and exalted. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Paul says in the book of Philippians that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of all. From Matthew to Revelation, Jesus is the subject. He's the center When they come to church, when they gather around to worship as God's people, Jesus is at the center. His word, both written and the living word, is in their midst and he is central. In fact, Acts chapter 5 and verse 42 says this, Daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They kept the main thing, the main thing. How easy is it for churches to get off to the right or to the left? And the reason they do is because they have failed to keep Jesus at the center. To keep His Word as the rule and standard for the body of believers. They persevered in right doctrine. I wish I could have been on the Emmaus Road. I would have liked to have been one of those apostles or disciples that walked down that dusty road, forlorn, discouraged, probably scared, and a stranger begins walking with them. Luke 24. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, all the Old Testament, Jesus expounded to them all of the places in the Old Testament where He was mentioned. Have you ever read the Old Testament looking for Jesus? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. You know, the the early church didn't have a New Testament. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament. And so the book you hold in your hand tonight, both Old and New Testament, That is the center of our worship. And in it, let me tell you something tonight. Could I just tell you this, that this book, this book right here is not primarily about love or holiness or repentance or anything. This book is about a person. This book is about Jesus And in Jesus there is love, and in Jesus there is holiness. And to get to Jesus there must be repentance, and all of that's there. But don't miss it. This book is about the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And they centered their lives around a person. He had so transformed them. He had so uh, changed their life, they could not escape. In fact, the early church in Antioch were termed As a term of derision, they were called Christians. You know what Christian means, right? Little Christs. You know what they would say, the people in Antioch, the unbelievers, the scoffers, when they saw Christians go by, the early church? Ah, there goes a little Christ. Look at those little Christs. I wonder if anyone could point their finger at us and accurately say, there goes a little Christ. These people had been so transformed by His grace and love and power that He literally poured out of them to where they they had to be called what they were, little Christ. Christians. 
They were believing the right thing about the right person. Jesus was at the center. Luke or John and Peter were hauled before the Sanhedrin, that mighty body of Jewish leaders. They were threatened not to speak or preach in the name of Jesus, right? You remember that? And as they stood before this great council, there were all kinds of PhDs sitting there who knew and could quote much of the Old Testament. They were sitting in a semicircle, and Peter and John were standing in the middle. And Luke says in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, that they took note of Peter and John of two things. Number one, they were unlearned and ignorant. In other words, they took note that they were uneducated and that they had been with Jesus. Oh God, oh God, would somehow... At least sometimes people catch the aroma of the life of Jesus in me so that when I leave their presence, they may be able to note he has been with Jesus. The reason this early church was so powerful is because they centered their worship, their very lives around the person of Jesus Christ They made much of Jesus. Not only was this early church powerful because they persevered in right doctrine, they believed the right thing about the right person, but secondly, they persevered or they were powerful because they persevered in unity. Did you notice? Did you notice what Luke says about their unity? Verse 44, this may be the most unbelievable, incredible statement in the New Testament about the church. All that believed were together. All that believed were together. Unity. And they had all things common. And look at verse 40, 46. Isn't this a great picture of unity? Verse 46, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and they didn't just live this way in church. Breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now we know that these early believers didn't agree with each other on everything. We know that there were differences of opinions about a whole host of things. And we read about some of them in in the book of Acts. But they were united about the person of Jesus Christ. And notice that these early church Christians persevered in unity. They worked at staying unified. They continued daily in the temple and from house to house, eating with one another. You know, I I know some churches and some denominations that it kind of seems like they think it's worldly for Christians to eat together in church. You know, we better not have too much fun. And yet Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that that early church ate together. And he mentions it at least once, maybe twice, in this description. They were eating together, and their eating together was one of the reasons for their unity. I think Christians ought to eat together. I'll tell you why. Because if you spend time across the table from a fellow believer sharing a meal and you get to know him or her, you get to know their background, understand where they come from, figure out what it is that makes them tick, and you build and cultivate a friendship, a relationship, when the debate gets hot in the boardroom or in the church business meeting, and you're debating each other, you realize you're not debating just someone over here who you don't know. You're debating a friend, someone you've cultivated a friendship with. So these early believers knew they they had to stay together. They weren't going to be able to just naturally 
stay together. It's people who think you throw a bunch of Christians in, a, in the same room and they're all going to automatically get along haven't lived very long, have they? Unity in church is a whole lot like unity in a good marriage. Oh, it got quiet real quick. Anyone here who has a successful marriage tonight know, knows that if you're going to have a good, strong marriage, a unified marriage, both of you will have to compromise. I had a, an old preacher, and I don't say that disrespectfully at all. He's a wonderful man of God, but he was an old man. He attended my church, and he, his glory days were behind him. And he stood in my pulpit, and I don't know really what he was preaching on, but he said these words, In 50 years of marriage, my wife and I have never had a crossword. Mm. And I thought to myself, as I think right now, either someone's a doormat, or, or you're getting old and you're forgetting. <laughs> My wife and I have had just a few moments of intense fellowship <laughs> in our marriage. She's a firstborn. I'm the baby. You don't think that translates into marriage. You ain't married. And what we realized was if we were going to truly be unified, not just, not just in, in, in theory, not just in presentation to the, to the world, because there's a lot of couples that appear unified. And then one day you wake up and realize he's left or she's left and underneath their marriage was rotten. So you understand that in marriage, little things become big things, right? You, you know, he's, he's all cute and funny before you're married, but that all changes. He's not nearly as cute as funny after you're married. And she's all beautiful and lovely before, and I'm not going to touch that, so I'll just leave that one alone. <laughs> But if we're going to have unity, I'm going to have to give, she's going to have to give. I'm going to have to come her way, she's going to have to come my way. I'm not right all the time. I know that's hard to believe. I'm not right all the time. I talk, she listens. She talks, I listen. There's give and take, compromise, right? Same thing in church. You're not always right. And sometimes, sometimes, listen to me, you don't even need to say anything. You just need to smile and lock arms with your brothers and sisters. I'm a part of a, a denomination. I don't know if that gets me in trouble or not, but when I, when I joined, I was just, I'd never been a part. My dad pastored an independent church. Um, you can blame her if you have problems with that. Uh, my first general conference, this denomination was not splitting. They were adding another group to their, under their banner. And two of my heroes, strong, powerful preachers, popular you might say, and I mean popular, they were well respected. My first general conference, I'm, I don't know, maybe 22 or 24 years old, and I'm not saying anything, I'm just observing. These two men on the conference floor get into a debate. And neither one of them are backing down. And before the one can finish his point and sit down, the other one is on his feet, back at the other, and they're back and forth. And, and I'm wringing my hands. What on earth is happening? And man, they, they went back and forth. Heated disagreement, debate. And then we broke for lunch. And I went up to the dining hall, and there they were, sitting across from the table from each other, eating a meal, laughing and talking. They were friends. They had an honest disagreement. They debated about it, and they stayed friends. 
They, they stayed brothers. They didn't have to take their ball and go home. You know people that if, if everything doesn't go exactly their way in church, they don't paint it the right color, the pews aren't the right place, the pastor preaches too long or too short, and the choir is this or that, they just take their ball and go home. And they're going to start a church in their basement with mom and dad and grandpa and aunt Nellie and a couple neighbor girls. And we'll show them. Yeah, you, you will show them. Jesus said, by this will the world know you're my disciple. By how conservatively you dress? By how loudly you preach? No. By your love. One for the other. Not your love for the world, but your love for each other. The world will know you're the real deal when they see you love each other. Which tells me that the kind of love Jesus was talking about, must have, must, he must have meant something so fervent and so genuine that it was easily observable to the watching world. To where the world could look at a body of believers and say, behold how they love one another. Oh, God, help us. If we're going to stay unified, we're going to have to work at it. Be proactive. Keep lines of communication open. Don't let bitterness and resentment build up. Jesus said, if you're at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave the altar. Jesus said, stop praying. Stop worshiping. You know why? Because you're never going to get anywhere with him until you get things fixed up with your brother. Jesus says, stop. Stop your worship. Stop your prayers. Go get things fixed up. I believe with all of my heart, Brother Tony, if Jesus were here tonight, he'd look at you and say, don't even wait for the sermon to end. Go right now and get things fixed up. My dad pastored the same church for 30 years when we came back from the mission field. The same church for 30 years, and in 30 years there never was one schism, not one break. Oh, he had people come and go, but there was never any, any church split, right? And a miracle, really. You look around the world today, and so many churches are, are splitting and splintering. And people say, well, that's not bad. You have a church of 500, and they split. That means you have two churches of 250. No, you don't. You maybe have a, church, a couple churches with 100, and the rest of the people are sick and tired of the infighting and the garbage. My dad, I wondered, how is it that God helped him to keep that church together? And it wasn't just, you know, 10 or 12 people. It's a good-sized church for, for us, a couple hundred people that attended that church. And, and throughout the years of his ministry, it continually grew, just incrementally, but over across the years, it just grew stronger numerically as well as spiritually. How did that happen? And I remember dad loved to conduct what he called say-so meetings. And, and this was something, I think it was, the, it, was in his, it was in his heart, he came up with this. And a say-so meeting could happen at any time in a, in a service, in a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night prayer meeting, revival service, whatever. Dad would, it, it went like this, dad would come to the, the podium and he would ask Judith, our piano player, Judith, would you please come to the piano? And I want you to play. I'm so glad I'm a, we're a part of the family of God. I want the congregation to stand. And here's what he would say. I, I want you to find three, four, five people in the congregation tonight who you really love and appreciate. And I want you to go to them as we're singing this song and go to them and say so. Tell them, brother, I love you. Sister, I love you. I appreciate you. I can still hear them to this day. If it's a, give them a handshake. If it's appropriate, give them a hug. And say, brother, I love you. I appreciate you. Sister, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your friendship. Why is it so hard for us to say nice things to each other and about each other? Why is that so hard? It's way easier for us to say negative things. Let me, let me tell you something tonight. You ought to tell your preacher, and I don't know anything about y'all, so let me just meddle a little bit. 
Tell them that it was a great sermon when you walk out Sunday morning. You say, I don't want them to get the big head. You listen, you let, you let the Lord worry about that. He has ways of humbling His preachers. You do your best to give them the big head. God will keep us humble. Say something nice. Can't think of anything nice? Find something. If I were to go home Cincinnati Sunday and my friend would say, hey, where were you? And I'd tell him, Church of God of Licking County. And he'd say, man, what's that? Where's that? I would tell him. And if I would say, listen, that, that place is on fire. I mean, God's moving. Things are happening. People are getting saved. The Spirit of God is in that place. Oh, he'd give lip service. Oh, wow, that's great. Wonderful. But it wouldn't be long if I continued down that positive trail until his eyes would kind of glass over. But if I were to come to that same person and say, hey, listen, you know where I just was? Listen, I got to tell you, there's some major problems going on. Oh, eyes would brighten. <laughs> oh, brother, yes, brother Mark, please tell me about it. I want to help you pray. <laughs> right? Why is it that we're so apt to say negative things? I'll tell you why we're so apt to say negative things, because so many of us want to listen to negative things. You want to get rid of the gossip in your church? Stop listening to him or her. We wouldn't have any gossips if we didn't have gossipies, gossipers if we didn't have gossipies. The next time she comes or he comes and says to you, listen, i got to tell you something, did you hear? Why don't you just say, you know, I, I don't, I don't really want to hear that. I don't think you should be telling me this. I can promise you they won't come to you again. Right? The problem is we love to hear all the, all the dirt. You know, terms change. And my kids, you know, when they were teenagers and then when they got into college, I would ask the most ridiculous question when I saw them with a, a young lady you know, eating together several times in a row and, and maybe in the car together. or And I would ask the most ridiculous question. You know what it was? Hey, are you guys dating? And they would say, Dad, psh, we're not dating. Evidently, that's out of style. Well, what are you doing? We're hanging out. Okay. Well, what that hanging out 30 years ago we called dating. Right? Terms change. Listen to me. If we're gonna if we're gonna stay unified, we're gonna have to work at it. Be proactive. And then dad would say this. And if you know that there's something between you and another person here tonight, some misunderstanding, some relationship trouble, he would say, I want you to go to them and say so. Brother, sister, I don't want there to be anything between us. Can we get things fixed up? I'm willing to take the blame. I'm willing to change. I'm will I just don't want there to be anything between us. And dad, every couple of months, two or three months, he would have these spontaneous say-so meetings to where that church was proactively communicating with, with each other, keeping the lines of communication open. That church never had a split in 30 years. Why? Because they worked at staying unified. They believed the right thing about each other. We're family. And you don't have to agree with everything to worship with that person. Amen? I love the story about the man who, there was a building project, he was the lone voice against it, and he spoke out loudly and fervently that he was against it, he gave all of the reasons why he was against the building program, but it came to a vote. Everyone voted yes for it except for him. The vote was over. The decision had been made and he stood up as soon as the vote was announced and everyone thought, oh no. And he said, Pastor, I would like to be the first one to write a check for the building program. Wow. Didn't go his way. He didn't get sour. He didn't go off and lick his wounds. Then go off and start talking bad about everyone because they decided something, you know, that he didn't like. He got on board. Unity. It's not always easy. 
But if this church wants to be as powerful as that early church, we're going to have to fight to stay together. Don't let the devil get in. He loves to sow discord. And then this early church was effective not only because they persevered in, in the right doctrine, they believed the right thing about the right person. They persevered in unity. They believed the right thing about each other. But lastly, they persevered in praise. They believed the right thing about worship. Listen to what verse 47 says. That this church was praising God. You say, well, that's not, that's not really profound. I mean, that's what the church is supposed to do. They're supposed to praise God. Why would Luke, under the inspiration of the Spirit, write that this early church was praising God? What's so important about that that we should know that? The reason that's important is because this early church was facing the fires of persecution. There were dark days. And their leaders were being beheaded and imprisoned and it wouldn't be long until they would be scattered all over the place because they were, they were in the dark night of the soul. They were in serious pain and confusion. And yet Luke says in the middle of that, this church was known for what? Praising God. The most powerful witness we can give the world is to praise God when things aren't going our way. When our, our life is in shambles and someone uh, close to us maybe has passed away, not that we don't cry, not that we don't grieve, but God can enable us and empower us to put on a smile and praise the Lord. Listen to Job. When everything was ripped away from him, he stood and he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Great black preacher E.V. Hill preached his wife's funeral. I don't know if you ever heard that. I'll never forget as a little kid hearing that black preacher preach and shouting the words over his wife's casket, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And in tears he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. What a powerful witness. You know, when you do that, when God enables you to do that, your unbelieving co-workers and neighbors are going to say, whatever kind of religion that is, if I ever get it, I want that. That's why that early church was so powerful. It was praising God in the middle of persecution. And, and notice the conjunctions. They were, verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God is linked to having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. You want to know a church where people are getting saved? It's a praising church. Praising God anytime, all the time. You know, our job as the church is to make much of Jesus and to make Him look good to the world. We were in Mexico for a number of years and we fell in love with the culture and the people, uh, the geography, and the food. I've had the privilege of traveling to a number of uh, uh, Latin cultures in Central America and South America and some islands in the Caribbean. And uh, Mexico, far and away, has the most exotic diet of, of any of them. Um, when I first went there, someone said to me, Brother, do you like menudo? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that is. And my friend said to me, my Mexican friend, oh, he said, we all love it. That wasn't true. But he said, we all love it. You have to try it. What is it? He said, well, it's, it's, it's pig or cow intestine soup. You, you got to try it. I didn't have the heart to tell him I have trouble choking down green beans, so I'm not going to eat cow stomach. But he said, I'll take you to a restaurant, right? I'll take you to a restaurant and you can try it there, which is good because had he taken me to his home and his wife would have made it, I would have been culturally obligated to eat it because they will say, if you don't eat their food in their house, they will say, are you going to offend me and not eat my food? Even if it is pig intestine. So I went to this restaurant and he ordered for us and the waiter came out these bowls, big bowls of steaming red soup with chunks of intestine floating around in it. 
And I said, Lord, how on earth am I going to Am I going to do this? I told him I'd try a bite, and I leaned over to kind of get a whiff, and folks, it smelled like an open sewer. And and I thought, there's no way. But I told him I would, and and you know, the Bible says, blessed is the man who sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So I said, okay, and I'll be honest, I didn't even touch the stuff floating around. I just got a little bit of the, you know, a little bit of the broth or whatever, and I took a tiny little sip, and it tasted just like it smelled, and I said... I said, brother, I can't, I can't handle that. And he laughed and smiled. We had a good time. They bring it out at weddings and quinceaneras, and it's, it's, it's a specialty. They love grasshoppers to eat grasshoppers. Went into a, a market in southern Mexico with a pastor friend of mine. He said, I want to come in here and get something for my, my little boy back at home. And we made our way back the aisles. And you know those big, like in Walmart, the big candy aisles that you just have rows? It was kind of like that. But instead of candy, it was different kinds of insects. And he went to the grasshopper bin. And he got that, you know, the scoop. And a big old scoop of grasshoppers and put it in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag, and took it home to his son. And the next day, I saw his little son outside of his house with that bag just popping them in his mouth like, you know, peanuts or something. He told me, we were sitting in his house, he said, you have to try grasshoppers. And I said, no, I don't. (laughs) He said, yeah, you got to try them. So I tried one. And got a leg stuck in my throat. (laughs) But I got it down. But Mexico is a land of tacos, right? U.S., there's a hamburger stand everywhere. Down there, tacos are everywhere. And they got a lot of weird tacos, too. I I mean, tacos that I wouldn't touch. They got intestine tacos and brain tacos and eyeball tacos. I mean, I want to say so bad sometimes, where's the beef, right? I want to somehow, please just, I have more than one time I've in my heart said, I'm happy with rice and beans. I don't have to have anything exotic. Tacos. We fell in love with a kind of taco uh, that's called tacos al pastor. And it literally means tacos the shepherd's way. And I don't know if you've ever seen Arab food, Arabic food, like falafel, the meat, it's on a spit. Well, this is the idea. They have this big, big slab, for lack of a better word, on a spit that rotates. And, and there's, there's a, like a blowtorch that comes out on the side of it, this built-in, that cooks it as it goes around so that the edges of that, it's, it's marinated pork. And, and so that, the, that it cooks, you know, that flame cooks the meat and then it kind of singes the outside of the meat so that it's nice and, and crispy. And then that chef will slice that marinated pork on the grill and then he'll take homemade corn tortillas and put that marinated pork uh, on that tortilla, and then in this one restaurant we would go to, there was a pineapple sitting on top of the the meat, and he would expertly slice a little bit of that pineapple, and it would land right on the pork and the homemade tortilla, and then we'd take those tacos to our table, and there was all kinds of salsa and and, and cilantro and and cheese and all kinds of stuff. You, You talk about good eating. I mean, delicious and I don't mean to, to talk badly about Mexican food because there's a lot of be- much more good food than bad. I could take you to a place right now, a pastor's home with a wife. If she cooked you Mexican food, you'd never go to whatever Tex-Mex place is again. I mean, it's just delicious. But the, my favorite place for these tacos was a, was, a street, was a street stand. And I guess I liked his a little bit better because instead of a pineapple on top of this marinated pork, he had a big blob of fat. And and we didn't eat the fat. No, that's gross. But the fat would melt with the heat and it would drizzle down into that meat. And you talk about delicious. It wasn't healthy, but it was delicious. And I'd walk past that stand and I'd see people eating that food. And before I ever saw what they were eating, I saw them. You know, I never one time saw anyone eat those tacos like this. They get their plate of tacos and... They grab hold of one taco and they hold it out and kind of look at it suspiciously on all sides and then very gingerly put it to their nose and sniff and then make a face and then 
You just, just very reluctantly take a tiny little bite. No, I never did. They ate those tacos like I ate those tacos. We'd have preachers come down. They wanted to preach in our churches. I'd say, come, you've got to try these tacos. And we'd all get our tacos. There's no place to sit. You're just standing on the street, right? And here's what we'd do. We'd get our plate of tacos, and we'd say, okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this food. Amen. Mmm. 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 Right? That's how everybody ate those tacos. And before you ever saw the tacos, you saw them enjoying the food. So that you said, whatever that is they're eating, I think I want that. I know that's a silly illustration. But maybe it helps us to understand that the world needs to see us enjoying our relationship with Jesus. So that when they see us Tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, they say, oh, whatever it is they have, I want it. That early church was powerful because they persevered in praise. It was powerful because they persevered in unity. And it was powerful because they persevered in right doctrine and made much of Jesus. And we're a part of that church through the Holy Spirit. God wants to make this church a lighthouse in this community. Oh God, my prayer is, oh God, would you revive your people again? Give us such a revival of a thirst for your word and a revival of a thirst for unity and a revival of a thirst for praise that will be unstoppable as the Holy Spirit fills us as a church. Let's stand together tonight. It's been a wonderful crowd to preach to. Would you bow your heads with me? pray in closing. Father, we thank you for your word tonight that speaks so clearly to us about your design for your church. Lord, we want to be a part of that church and by faith we are a part of it. You have baptized us by your spirit into the church. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us. And so we are a part of it. Lord, would you empower us, enable us, strengthen us so that once again your people might turn this world upside down. Even though, Lord, we know we're, we're actually turning it right side up, it's this world that's upside down. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, in power and victory, go out into the community and make a difference. Thank you for your word tonight and for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to page 392, please, in your big books. Page 392. More love to Thee, O Christ, more love to We got to believe that God has sent Sister Ingram and Brother Sankey to us this week. The Spirit has definitely witnessed and confirmed, and this meeting's well on the way to being a good one. And we've got to believe that we're being highly honored 
by the faithfulness of God. And I don't know about you, but I suspect most everybody, if not everybody in the building, has said to themselves through this message, that's the kind of church I want to be. And the only way that I think we can do anything further is to pray this prayer as we sing another verse. Everybody in the building ought to pray this prayer. And I don't mean to pray it formally or routinely or as a duty or an obligation. But this is a prayer that we all need to pray to be that New Testament church. And it's a short prayer, but if you mean it tonight, and we'll take a moment or two to pray that prayer. There's no telling what the rest of this week will be like. And this is the prayer. Lord, and you've got to really mean it. Lord, make me more like Jesus. Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to have all the anger issues. I don't want to just make the main thing negative all the time. And the brother's right. Our ears start twitching when we hear the bad news. Lord, make me more like Jesus. And when that person comes here and doesn't comes in here and doesn't look like us doesn't smell like us. Lord, make me like Jesus and help me to go up to him and he'll know. Help me to go up to him and make him feel like he really belongs here before he even believes. Lord, help me to love that, that one person who gets on my nerves. You can go right down the, the alphabet, A through Z. And I, I am asking you, and I want to be the example, and I want to pray. Lord, make this church and make me more like Jesus. Believe me, we'll walk out of here differently than we came in. This was a beautiful message. I don't know him that well, but I heard him preach one time. And I knew I needed to hear him preach some more. And we got an opportunity to hear him this week to preach some more. So Lord, a lot of things bother me. A lot of things upset me. But I want to pray that prayer and I want to accept this challenge. I want, Lord, with your help, and every one of us has room. Make me more like Jesus. How many be willing to pray that prayer tonight with me? 
And let's pray as we sing another verse. Once earthly joy I crave, sought peace and rest. Now Anybody? Make us more like Jesus. I'm going to ask Justin to sing one more verse. And I'm going to go down and sit on the altar because I can't kneel because of my knees being replaced. I want to be more like Jesus. And as your pastor and your under shepherd, I want you to be more like Jesus too. Maybe some would want to join me. Okay? One more verse. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise this be the parting cry my heart 
We'll see you tomorrow night at 7. Thank you for your attentiveness.